Hello, and welcome to the Ford Theater Lincoln Online Oratory Project, or Loop Release Party. My name is Tamikia Jackson, and I am a teaching artist with Ford's Theater, and I'm the Learning Communities Manager with Maker Ed. Hi, and I'm Cynthia Gertson, Associate Director for Arts Education with Ford's Theater, and I am fortunate enough to work with Ford's teaching artists and colleagues like Tamikia. And I'm fortunate to work with you as well, Cynthia. Congratulations to all our Loop participants this year. We had over 500 students from 14 schools across the country participate. These students did some incredible work with us this year. And you know, at Ford's Theater, we believe that words have power. We look to the words of Abraham Lincoln and other equally incredible orators to help us understand where we've been as a country, where we are presently, and what kind of society we want to shape for the future. All the orators you'll hear today used their words to inspire, challenge, and unite. Yeah. You know, Cynthia, do you have a favorite from today's selections? I do. Frederick Douglass's What to the Slave is Your Fourth of July. It's incredibly mm. powerful. What about you? Totally agree. I think, though, that my favorite, it's actually a tie between Eleanor Roosevelt's The Case for Human Rights and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I've Been to the Mountaintop. They both highlight our collective responsibility to each other, and that's really, like, resonating with me. Mm. So let's get started. Our first group of speeches include three by Abraham Lincoln, including his Gettysburg Address and Douglas's powerhouse speech, What to the Slave is Your Fourth of July. The classrooms range from eighth grade all the way up to high school. Let's take a look. Mr. President, gentlemen of the convention, if we could just know where we are and whether we appear to be tending, we could all better judge on what to do and how to do it. We are now well into our fifth year since a policy was initiated with the avowed object and confident purpose of putting an end to slavery agitation. However, under the operation of that policy, that agitation has not only not ceased, but has constantly augmented. In my opinion, it will not cease until a crisis shall have been reached and passed. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot and are permanently cast slaves as free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest this further spread and place it where the public mind shall rest in belief that it is on a course of ultimate extinction or its advocates shall press it forward until it shall become alike lawful in all of the states, old as well as new, north as well as south. Have we no tendency to this latter condition? Our cause then must be entrusted to and conducted by its own undoubted friend, those whose hands are free and whose hearts are in the work, who do care for the result. Two years ago, the Republicans of this nation mustered up some 1,300,000 strong. We did this under a single impulse of resistance to a common danger. With every external circumstance against us, of strange, discordant, even hostile elements, we gathered from the four winds. We fought the battles under the constant hot fire of a pampered, proud, disciplined army. Did we brave all then only to falter now? Now when that same enemy is wavering, dissevered, and belligerent, the result is not doubtful. We shall not fail. If we stand firm, we shall not fail. Wise counsels may accelerate or mistake delay, but sooner or later, the victory is sure to come. Four 
score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent, a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives. That that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate. We cannot consecrate. We cannot hollow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little know, no longer remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here, dedicated to the great task remaining before us. That from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave their last full measure of devotion. That we are highly resolved. That these dead shall have not died in vain that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people. By the people. For the people. Shall not spirit from the earth. Fellow citizens, pardon me and allow me to ask, why am I called to speak here today? What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? I say with a sad sense of disparity between us. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. This month of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. I do not hesitate to declare with all my soul that the character and conduct of this nation has never looked blacker to me than on this 4th of July. Whether we turn to the declarations of the past or to the professions of the present, the conduct of the nation seems equally hideous and revolting. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer. A day that reveals to him, more than all other days of the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your shouts of liberty and equality hold a mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings. With all your religious parade and solemnity are to him your bombast, broad deception. There is not a nation of this earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States. It has long been a grave question whether any government can be strong enough to maintain its own existence in great emergencies. Durante mucho tiempo ha sido una pregunta grave si algún gobierno puede ser suficientemente fuerte para mantener su existencia en emergencias. On this point, the Federal Rebellion brought other republics to a severe test, and a presidential election occurring in regular course during rebellion, and added not a little the if the loyal people united were put to the utmost of their strength by the rebellion, must they not fail when divided and partially paralyzed by political war amongst themselves? <laughs> If the rebellion could force us to forego or postpone a natural election, it might fairly claim to have already conquered and ruined us. But the election, along with its incidental and undesirable strength, has done good too. It has demonstrated that a people's government can sustain a national election in the midst of a great civil war. Until now, it has not been known to the world that this was a possibility. Hey, Shows 
that, even among candidates of the same party, he who is most devoted to the Union and most opposed to treason can receive most of the people's votes. It shows to the extent he has known that the time will bring out the time when the war began. Gold is good in its place, but living, brave, patriotic men are better than gold. But the rebellion continues, and now that the election is over, may not all have a common interest reunite in a common effort to save our common country. Uh, por mi parte, me he esforzado y me esforzaré para evitar poner cualquier obstáculo en el camino. So long as I have been here, I have not willingly cast out a thorn in any man's bosom. I ask those who ask it's not different to me to join me in these things they're told to have. Y ahora permítanme terminar pidiendo tres victorias sinceros por nuestros valientes soldados y marineros y por sus gallardos y hábiles comandantes. And now let me close by asking three hearty cheers for our soldiers and seamen and their gallant and skillful commanders. Congratulations to those students. Their energy, you know, is really kind of infectious, especially those cheers at the end. So just a huge shout out to the students at Banneker High School, Mosaic Elementary School, Clear Spring Middle School, and George Washington Middle School. You know, I really kind of got tingles by like seeing the students and like different backgrounds saying words that I think are really important to all of us, as well as hearing the mix of languages in there. I think, um, you know, really thinking about how we are just a country of many different cultures um, and that our history is important to all of us. I agree. When I heard the hip hip hooray, I was silently doing it along with them in my head. Like that's how infectious it was. Yeah. Um, and I, so I want to say it takes a lot of support to make sure that the classrooms can learn their speeches and make their videos. So just taking a moment to say thank you to the school administrators, faculty, caregivers, and the community, community that surrounds the students who make sure that lines are memorized, Time is made available during the instructional day to learn the speeches, have the visits, make the video, and to edit the videos in the end. That is a lot of work. Cynthia, could you tell us a little bit more about the Lincoln Online Oratory Project? I would be happy to. The Lincoln Online Oratory Project offers three virtual visits with a Ford's teaching artist so that participating classrooms can learn the speech, learn how to perform it, um, and learn how to stage it. Our teaching artists work with classroom teachers and students to analyze speeches, learn those performance skills, get some staging done, and plan for that recording. These videos that we're seeing today are the end products of all of that hard work. Tamikia, will you talk to us about what you teach in a teaching artist visit during the program? Sure. Um, like you just said, you know, we continue as a teaching artist, we continue to go over historical context. We focus on podium points, which are skills that Ford's Theater has identified as things that good speakers do. So we all know when we see a good speaker, but it might be harder to pinpoint the actual um tools that they're using and like skills that they're using to make us connect with them and like hear and understand what they're saying. And so we go through those things. You know, I think my favorite moments are seeing the students really connect to the text and have those like light bulb occasions yeah. where things go off on like, what does this mean for my life now? Because it is both um, you know, understanding the words of the person who spoke them or wrote them and also being able to say to see why it's important today. And I just want to also give a special shout out to the classroom teachers. They do really awesome work to help their students understand the speeches. They go through the historical context and like really spelling out the history for it. We as teaching guards just kind of come in and reinforce that and help students to think through like, what is this really saying? What does it mean? And using those historical moments to connect to that. But the teachers film the videos, they edit the videos. It's really a great way to actively approach this really necessary, important content uh, that, and also build skills that will be useful for the students for life. Mm -hmm. 
all those skills and all those tools are very powerful. And so if you are a teacher who's watching today, but who did not participate in the program this year, good news, you can still do it next year. We will start accepting applications starting in August of 2022. Yay, awesome. Now that we know what the program is and how you can get involved next year, let's see some more videos from this year. question whether any government can be strong enough to maintain its own existence in great emergencies. 
On this point, the President Rebellion brought our Republic to a severe test. And our presidential election, occurring in regular course during the Rebellion, added not a little to the strain. If the loyal people united were to be put to the utmost of their strength by the Rebellion, must they not fail when divided and partially paralyzed by political war among themselves? But the election was a necessity. We cannot have free government without elections. And if the rebellion could force us to forego or postpone a national election, it might fairly claim to already conquered and ruined us. But the election, along with incidental and undesirable strife, has done good too. It has demonstrated that a people's government can sustain a national election in the midst of the great civil war. Until now, it has not been known to the world that this was a possibility. It shows also how sound and how strong we still are. It shows that even among candidates of the same party, he who's most devoted to the union and most opposed to treason can receive most of the people's votes. It shows also to the extent yet known that we have more men now than we had when the war began. Gold is good in its place, but living, brave, patriotic men are better than gold. But the rebellion continues, and now that the election is over, we may not all, having a common interest, reunite in a common effort to save our common country. For my own part, I have striven and shall strive to avoid placing any obstacle in the way. So long as I have been here, I have not willingly planted a thorn in any man's bosom. May I ask those who have differed with me to join with me in this same spirit toward those who have. And now, let me close by asking three hearty cheers for our brave soldiers and seamen and their gallant and skillful commanders. The second inaugural address delivered by President Abraham Lincoln on March 4, 1865 in Washington, D.C. At the second appearing to take the oath of the presidential office, there is less occasion for extended address than there was at the first. And a statement somewhat in detail of a course to be pursued seemed fitting and proper. Now, at the expiration of four years, during which public declarations have been constantly called forth on every point in face of the great contest, which still absorbs the attention and engrosses the energies of the nation, little that is new could be presented. The progress of our arms, upon which else chiefly depends, is as well known to the public as to myself, and it is, I trust, reasonably satisfactory and encouraging to all. With high hope for the future, no prediction in regard to it is ventured. On the occasion corresponding to this four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war. All dreaded it all sought to avert it. Why will the inaugural address was being delivered from this place of it all together to saving the Union without war? Urgent agents were in the city seeking to destroy it without war, seeking to dissolve the Union and divide effects by negotiation. Both parties deprecated war, but one of them would make war rather than let the nation survive. And the other would accept the war rather than let it perish. And the war came. Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray. that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. 
Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsmen, two hundred and fifty years of unrequited toil shall be sunk. And until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. As was said three thousand years ago, so still it must be said. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. With malice, swords, and on with charity for all. With firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we are in to bind up the nation's wounds. To care for him, we shall have borne the battle for his widow and his orphan. To do which all may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Great job. Another group of hardworking students. I uh, have videos from them. Thank you to students at Two Rivers, Fourth, Fourth Street, Lee Montessori, Fair Hill Elementary School, and South Douglas Elementary School. You know, uh, there was just so much like energy and connection to those words and to the ideas that were in that speech. They, they made those words come alive. Tamikia, there is a moment in every single speech video that, that gets me every time. Um, so I think that that speaks not just to the power of the speeches, but also to the hard work and the talent of all of our participating classrooms this year. And that energy from the students at Two Rivers, Fourth Street, I love it. Yes, absolutely. I also like the artwork that was behind mm -hmm. the last one. That was really cool, too. So we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Bloomberg Philanthropies. Thank you so much for supporting the program. Through their generous support, we are able to work with such wonderful teachers and students in this program as the ones that we have seen and will see. We want to hear from our sponsors now, Bloomberg Philanthropies. Hi, I'm Josh Eastred. I'm the CEO of Bloomberg Industry Group. Bloomberg Philanthropies has been proud to support Ford's theater since 2010. And I'm really excited that all of you are getting to participate in such a great program. It's the kind of thing I wish I had had available to me when I was in school. I lead a big organization and I have to share updates with my colleagues and my teammates and my customers all the time. So the skills that you're learning here are things that I use every day in my job. And public speaking is a big part of it. Public speaking is important for a few good reasons to me. First off, it lets you take ideas that are really complicated and make them accessible to everybody. Second, it lets you take ideas that you're passionate about and get others excited about them too. And last, in times like this, public speaking lets you express empathy and let people know that you care. So the work that you're doing now is really important and I'm confident you're gonna use it in the years ahead. I've always enjoyed coming to Ford's Theater to see the great presentations by classes of Lincoln's words, and I'm looking forward to seeing it virtually this year. So congratulations and good luck. All right, we are rolling into our third block of videos. We received so many from the participating schools this year. As we said, we had over 500 students that participated and we could not include them all in today's watch party. But I encourage everyone watching and if you know someone who's not watching but would love to see your shining face, then tell them to go as well and watch the other videos on the Lincoln or Online Oratory Project playlist of the Ford's YouTube channel. That's right. A lot of great videos and they're and they're going to be up on Ford's YouTube channel. There will be a Lincoln Online Oratory Project playlist for this program year. So definitely check those out. 
So this next block includes another interpretation of the Gettysburg Address, because we all love Lincoln, plus two 20th century historical speeches. They are your faves mentioned at the top of our watch party, Tamikia, Eleanor Roosevelt's incredible human rights speech, and Dr. Martin Luther King's I've Been to the Mountaintop. Mm. Just hearing you say that, I'm I'm getting ready for it. <laughs> you know, I find it fascinating to hear similar themes in these speeches as what we heard from the two groups of speeches that featured Frederick Douglass's and Abraham Lincoln's. The themes of liberty, freedom, and our rights are a large part of what people have spoken up about throughout the history of our country and also throughout the history of the world. You know, and I, I think that's a part of why we chose those speeches. There are these other speeches is because they are kind of saying the same thing or been influenced by Lincoln's voice and Frederick Douglass's voice as well. Let's see how these classrooms have interpreted the next group of important speeches. The Gettysburg Address delivered November 19, 1863 in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation to conceive them to dedicate it can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of the field as the final resting place for those who gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground. The brave men living in death who have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little know nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living rather to be dedicated here, to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining for us. That from, the, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measures of devotion. That we are higher is all that these deaths shall not how that's in vain. That this nation under God is our new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. It seems to me there is a valid reason for taking the time today to think carefully and clearly on the subject of human rights because in the acceptance and observance of these rights lies the root of our chance of peace in the future. We must not be confused about what freedom is. Basic human rights are simple and easily understood. Freedom of speech and a free press, freedom of religion and worship, freedom of assembly and the right of petition, the right of men to be secure in their homes and free from unreasonable search and seizure and from arbitrary arrest and punishment. We must not be deluded by the efforts of the forces of reaction to prostitute the great words of our free tradition and thereby to confuse the struggle. Democracy, freedom, human rights have come to have a definite meaning to the people of the world, which we must not allow any nation to so change that they are made synonymous with suppression and dictatorship. The basic problem confronting the world today is the preservation of human freedom, the individual and consequently of the society of which he is part. The secret ballot is an essential to free elections. That is why when we see these liberties threatened, instead of falling apart, our nation becomes unified and our democracies come together as a unified group in spite of our varied backgrounds and many racial strains. It is my belief, and I am sure it is also yours, 
that the struggle for democracy and freedom is a critical struggle. The future must see the broadening of human rights throughout the world. People who have glimpsed freedom will never be content until they have secured it for themselves. In a truer sense, human rights are a fundamental object of law and government in a just society. Human rights exist to the degree that they are respected by people in relations with each other and by governments in relations with their citizens. The world at large is aware of the tragic consequences for human beings ruled by totalitarian systems. People who continue to be denied the respect in which they are entitled to as human beings shall not acquiesce forever in such denial. Something has happened in our world. The masses of people are rising up. And we're over there so much today. The cry is always the same. We want to be free. It is no longer a choice between violence and nonviolence in this world. It is nonviolence or non existent. We are masters in our nonviolent movement and disarming police forces. I remember in Birmingham, Alabama, when we were in that majestic struggle there, we would move out of the 16th Street Baptist Church day after day, and by the hundreds, we would move out. And Bull Corner would tell them to send the dogs forth, and they did come. But we went before them thinking, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. Bull Connor next would say, turn the fire hoses on. Bull Connor didn't know history. He knew a kind of physics that somehow didn't relate to the trans physics that we knew about. And that was the fact that there was a certain kind of fire that no water could put out. And we stood before the fire hoses. That couldn't stop us. We are going on. But we don't have to argue with anybody. We don't have to curse and go around and die with our words. We don't need any bricks and bottles. We don't need any malt up up down. We just need to go around to these stores and to these massive industries in our country and say, God sits us by here to say to you that you're not treating these children right. We've got to give ourselves to the struggle until the end. We've got to see it through. And when we have our march, you need to be there. If it means we can work, if it means we can school, be there. Be concerned about your brother. If you go up together, we go down together. Let us rise up tonight with a greater readiness. Let us stand with a greater determination. And let us move on in these powerful days, these days of challenge, to make America what it ought to be. We guess in the difficult days ahead of us, but it really doesn't matter what we have, because our veins are the mountaintop. And I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. Ain't no longer to go to the land. And I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. Great job, students at Fairhill Elementary School, Butler Elementary School, and Banneker High School. Really digging into those words, those big ideas that are, you know, really, as I said, relevant today and important for us to think about and to consider how do they show up in our lives. What do you think we take away from these speeches in the 21st century, Cynthia? So echoing what you say about how the, the the words in these speeches are so relevant, to me they ring so true even today, I'm struck by the idea that our democracy is still so new, even 250 years later, and it still takes effort on the part of all of us and work on a part of every citizen to ensure that it thrives. Right, that's so true. When I hear Eleanor Roosevelt's words about human rights being essential to democracy and Dr. King talking about the promised land, I'm reminded that like we are all continuing to make our country safe and inclusive for everyone, you know, and I think about the entire idea of like the American experiment <laughs> and how we're still living in that now um, and just how that is. It, it's something that we're making it, you know, the country has not become, but it is definitely still becoming. And that's exciting. And it's all, it's all of our responsibility to see that it, you know, lives up to the ideas and dreams that it was started with. I 100% agree. Well, we have reached our last group of speeches. Yay! I mean, I'm excited because I think that this is great work, not excited to be 
over and done with it. Um, we've got one more classroom interpretation of the Gettysburg mm -hmm. and another round of our 20th century historical speeches. This time, the group includes Mary McLeod Bethune's powerful speech, What Democracy Means to Me. Let's take a look. Democracy for me by Mary McLeod Bethune. Democracy is for me, a goal towards which a nation is marching. It is a dream and an ideal in whose ultimate realization we have a deep and abiding faith. As we have been extending a measure of democracy, we have brought to the nation rich gifts. We have helped to be in America with our labor, strengthened out our faith, and enriched it with our song. We, we have given you Paul Florence Dunbar, Book of Teamwork. Marian Anderson and George Washington Carver. But even these are only the first fruits of a rich harvest. Which will be reaped when you and wider fields are open to us. Our faith envisions a fundamental change as mutual respect and understanding between our races come in the path of spiritual awakening. We have always been loyal when the ideals of American democracy have been attacked. We have given our blood in defense. From Christmas Attucks on Boston Commons to the battlefields of France, we, we have fought. fought for the democratic principles of equality under the law, equality of opportunity, equality at the ballot box, for the guarantees of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yes, we, we have, have fought for America. With all her imperfections, not so much for what she is, but what we know she can be. Perhaps the greatest battles we forced, the fight for a new America, fearless, free, united, worldly, we are. That this nation under God will have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, for the people and by the people, shall not perish from the earth. This is what American democracy means to me. seems to me there's a valid reason for taking the time today to think carefully and clearly about the subject of human rights. Because an acceptance and observance of these rights lies the root of our chance for peace in the future. Our chance of peace in the future. We must not be confused on what freedom is. Basic human rights. Basic human rights. Thank you.
are simple and easily understood. Freedom of speech and a free press. Freedom of religion and worship. Freedom of assembly and the right to petition. The right of men to be secure for homes and free from unreasonable search and seizure, from arbitrary arrest and punishment. We must not be deluded by the efforts of the forces of reaction or prostitute, the great word of our free tradition, thereby to confuse the struggle. Democracy, freedom, and human rights have come to a definite meaning to the people of the world, which we must not let anything to change so that they are made synonymous with oppression and dictatorship. The basic problem confronting the world today is the privation of human freedom for the individual and consequently for society which he is a part. The sweet wood ballot is essential to free elections. That is why when we see these liberties threatened, instead of falling apart, our nation becomes unified and our democracies come together as a unified group, in spite of our varied backgrounds and many racial strains. It is my belief, and I'm sure it's also yours, that the struggle for democracy and freedom is a critical struggle. The future must see the broadening of human rights throughout the world. People who have glimpsed freedom will never be content until they have secured it for themselves. In the truest sense, human rights are found fundamental objects of law and government in just society. Human rights exist to a degree which they are respected by people in relations with each other and by governments in relations with their citizens. The world at large is aware of the tragic consequences for human beings ruled by the totalitarian systems. People who continue to be denied the respect to which they are entitled to as human beings will not acquiesce forever in such denial. I have been to the mountaintop by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. April 3rd, 1968, Mason Temple, Memphis, Tennessee. Something is happening in our world. The masses of people are rising up. And wherever they are assembled today, the cry is always the same. We, we want, want to be free! It's no longer a choice between violence and non-violence in this world. It's not violence or non-existence. We are masters in our non-violent movement in disarming police forces. I remember in Birmingham, Alabama, when we were in that majestic struggle there. We would move out of the 16th Street Baptist Church day after day. By the hundreds, we would move out. And Bull Connor would tell them to send the dogs for them. And they did come. But we just won before the dogs sang. Ain't hey, gonna let nobody turn me around. Bull Connor next would say, turn the fire hoses on. Bull Connor didn't know history. He knew a kind of physics that somehow didn't relate to the trans physics that we knew about. And that was the fact that there was a certain kind of fire that no water could put out. And we went before the fire hoses. That couldn't stop us. We are going on! We don't have to argue with anybody. We don't have to curse and go around and bow with our words. We don't need any bricks, no models. We don't need any Molotov cocktails. We just need to go around through these doors and to these massive industries in our country and say, God sent us by here to say to you that if you're not treating his children right, until then, we've got to see it through. And when we have our march, we need to be there. If it means leaving work, we need to leave school, be there. Be concerned about your brother, either. We, we go, go all together, together, or we go, go down together. together. Let us rise up tonight with a greater readiness. Let us stand with a greater determination. Let us move on with these, these powerful days, these days of challenge, to make America what it ought to be. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now, because I've been to the mountaintop, and I don't mind. Like anybody, I'd like to live a long, long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will, and he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight 
that we as a people will get to the promised land. Awesome! What a solid, great group of videos to end on. You know, I really, I, I saw so many of the podium points at work and in that group, you know, and just seeing their excitement and connection to the text. You know, something that occurred to me, Cynthia, is just how hard these students are working in these masks, you know, to be heard <laughs> and get their voices out there. Yeah, it's amazing, you know, um, and I just I really want to give a shout out <laughs> um, to all of the students, you know, thank you so much students at Two Rivers, Tyler Elementary School, Spark Te Spartech Academy and Fairhill Elementary School, just excellent work, you know, really bringing those words to life and bringing us into what it means to you. And thank you to all of our participants. You did a really great job, wonderful work, learning the speeches, understanding them, applying the context of them, and being heard. Great job. It's not easy. We want to say thank you to our teaching artists, the caregivers, teach, uh, other teachers, administration. It takes a village to make this happen. We want to thank the sponsors of our education program, including Bloomberg Philanthropies, and um, whose donations just help make all of our work possible. We are so glad to be able to continue this program, which, you know, gives a great opportunity for students to dig into the content, but also like dig into their skills and their understanding of it. Yep. And so if you enjoy today's conversation and all of the wonderful student work, please consider making a financial gift to Ford Cedar to support our mission and our work. You may do so at fords.org slash donate. And one last thing, um, I just wanted to make mention of uh, a wonderful workshop that we have next week. We are offering a virtual teacher workshop on Tuesday, April 26th from 4 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. It's called Giving Words to the Missing Voices, and it is a monologue writing workshop. It is a compliment to the incredible lesson plan that Tamikia created last year for us called Missing Voices. And it will be led by a wonderful, wonderful playwright and also um, public historian in our field, uh, Allie Hartley Kong. So if you are an educator and you are interested in learning more about how to use monologue writing as a way for your students to demonstrate understanding, please consider registering. You can find registration information also on Ford's web website, fords.org, and select the teacher programs page. Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Cynthia, this was so fun. It was super fun. I'm really glad that we got to do it together. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you next year. Yeah.